Hello, everyone. Just a quick word from your friendly editor slash husband. For all of you who listen to So I'm Watching This Show and own an Android device, do me a favor. Go to the Google Play Store and download the Podcast Republic app. It's a fantastic app that allows you to get all of your favorite podcasts directly on your Android devices. I use the app and love it. I can search for the podcasts I want to listen to, select them as favorites, and have them all just a click away. Make sure you set so I'm watching the show as a favorite so you don't miss any new episodes. Again, the app is Podcast Republic, available on your Android device. Thanks! I was going to launch right into the conversation about the hunt. And I was like, we have to build to that. <laughs> we should probably <laughs> so get into something say, else first. <laughs> yeah, we haven't really, other than a joke, we haven't actually addressed the whole coronavirus thing. So yeah. our slate has been wiped pretty clean for the next... Pretty clean! Certainly a month, so... Yeah, for, like the, definitely the end of March and then like most of April. Mm-hmm. So we're probably just going to watch some of our favorite old movies, which is kind of... a. That's kind of my sweet spot. I mean, yeah. if I'm really into a new release, then I'm like excited to talk about it. But we do reach a point sometimes where we have to go see things because they're the new release. And I'm like, oh, I guess I can come up with 20 minutes yeah. worth of something to say about this. But <laughs> right. So we're going to do uh, a couple of I guess we kind of call them deep cuts, but they're not deep cut movies. They're popular movies. But yeah. So well, for the most part, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see what we end up I'll with. I'll find a way to throw You them. are really, really lately talking about Brotherhood of the Wolf <laughs> a lot. So. I was to say, I'll find a way to throw Brotherhood of the Wolf in there. Yeah. <laughs> that accessible French fantasy foreign film. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Hello, everybody. I am Will. And I'm Kristen. And this is So I'm Watching This Show. On today's episode, we are going to talk about the controversial new film, The Hunt. The most talked about movie no one's seen yet. <laughs> I really didn't like that secondary ad that campaign. That marketing campaign was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Although I can't decide if it helped to hurt the movie because in a weird way, it real like really lowered my expectations. Yeah, that's fair. Believe it or not, I... I've been thinking about this movie the whole time we've been out and I was in a place where I was like, maybe I don't want to record right, right away. Like maybe I actually want to think about it and read some stuff. And then I Googled it real quick about 10 minutes before we sat down. I don't think you want to read this stuff. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, I don't think you want to read this stuff at all. <laughs> like not even a little bit. Yeah, Not even like one sentence of the stuff. I'm at a place where I'd, I would pay to not have to. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever think that like stuff on Twitter or like social media where it's like, I already don't follow a person, but I want to make a bigger deal about the, like, yeah. I want to actively disfollow. Someone? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Could you I'm imagine? Abs I've absolutely thought that where I like I want them to get a notification that says Kristen will never follow Does you. Not, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not interested at all in following you. I think it would it would throw some of the statistics into disarray. Like it might. It definitely might. Some of those. Millions of people that follow the Kardashians might. Yeah, <laughs> it might topple on its head. OK, for those who don't know, and most anybody listening to this will know, but The Hunt is a movie. Bravo. <laughs> the end. <laughs> well, I, I pulled up the Wikipedia. It says <laughs> oh, okay. variously described as a black comedy, horror and thriller. It's a satire. It's a flat yeah, I, satire. Yeah. Uh, it's directed by Craig Zobel and written by Damon Lindelof and Nick Cause. Cuse. 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 Like Carlton Cuse. Yeah, yeah, from yeah. From Lost. Uh, and it stars some people that we'll get into. It is a Bloom House, which, as we've said before, they have kind of a track record. But at yeah, this point, this is I'm like, more excited than not for Bloom House. Usually, yeah. And this is like the least Bloom Housey Bloom House movie. Like, this wasn't like a scary movie. No. It wasn't like horror, like it was gory, but it wasn't like a horror movie. Well, it's very gory, but it I think I I flinched twice. Like, did it mm. phase you? Uh, a couple of times just because of some of the implements that were used being used as like means of murder. Yeah, a couple like, of scenarios. Like I didn't care for the meat thermometer. <laughs> Uh, well, by that point. Well, by that point, yes, but I still like didn't like friend. it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like it. No, well, I, I guess that, that was the first thing. I mean, I knew it was rated R, but it's very gory. But for me, it's one of the movies where it plays a little bit more for comedy than it does actual Correct. torture porn or like yes. distress. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I was surprised by that. Like, I, I think I I think I like flinched or covered my eyes twice, but 
Okay, so before before we actually get into it, uh, it was supposed to come out in September, and then there was... Uh, August, <laughs> actually, I think. Uh, I think it was September 27th. Really? Because something that I read said August. Whatever. That's not important. Well, it was... I think... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I almost, no, I almost made a joke, and I was like, I cannot... There was a shooting, and I was about to be yeah. like, well, which one? Like, There were like two or three two or three like right in a row and they were the very politically charged yeah. ones where like the killer's manifesto was all about like you know politics politics and like the liberal elite and shit mm-hmm. so and so they pulled it and i hate when they do that and i it's it's so 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 stupid for the most part we don't really talk politics all that much uh mm-hmm. unless it is uh relevant yeah. And I doubt we're going to have like a political discussion in this episode. But just here's your kind of like trigger warning. Yeah, we we might talk a little bit about our personal politics and the politics of the movie. And I I am open to having a conversation about delaying things because of shootings. OK, because I also think it's deeply stupid to do that, especially for a movie like this, which is not as political as it thinks it is, mm-hmm. nor does it make the message that any of the murders within the movie are the good or right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Like, nobody really comes out, like, neither side really comes out on top of the, like, morality of this movie. The politics is the single least interesting part of the movie. A hundred percent. And it so may, that's... Like, that one conversation and eyes out is 30 times more politically charged than this entire movie. Definitely. And and, though, and 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 that's the thing is like what I was talking about it with Will on the drive home and it's like they don't skewer either side more than the other mm-hmm. and they don't skewer either side enough to be making the argument. It sort of was like I couldn't decide if it knew what it was trying to do in that regard. And that was kind of frustrating. But like if we want to get to get back to the like canceling things for because of shootings, I think there was a time when it was the smart and sensitive thing to do, like back when we were in high school and like middle school and high school when like Columbine was happening and all the school shootings were happening because there was an episode of Buffy that got pushed to the end of the season because there is someone in the clock tower with a machine gun, essentially. There was an episode of Muppets Tonight yeah. that didn't air because a, one of the Muppets had a bomb. And yeah. I was like, really? So I understand that is like a, a leaving aside the fact that Jonathan is in that episode of Buffy, spoiler alert, is trying to kill himself and not students. It is framed in a way that could have been very triggering for kids in 1999, I think. My point is like there was a time when that sensitivity was was nice and i think it was the smart thing to do but now because of the way the world is and because we can't go three days without a mass shooting i think it's deeply stupid to keep thinking that going to see a movie is making these people do this stuff well and furthermore a this wasn't on television yeah you have to pay and go to see Mm -hmm. this because they did they did a similar thing because I, I so completely agree. We're not going to do anything. We're just flat out not going to do anything about gun violence. So it's like, why are we even pretending it matters anymore? Like, 100%. why are we like, wh- like, why? Why are you even choosing to, like, die on this morality hill when, you know, ever since Columbine happened, n- no, no gun reforms have taken I, place. I get to a place where I'm like, if you want me to take this seriously, then you need to take it seriously. Like, it, exactly. It just, I, I'm being I'm being actively glib here. I'm choosing to behave this way because it's like it's just to a point where I was like I when you were like it was August and I was like September and I was like I don't know when was the big shooting. It could be any time. Like, exactly. And it's like well how many have there been since then? Like thirty. Yeah. And I'm like I I don't want to pretend that I care with my entertainment like that. Yeah, I care in real life, but it's like you're you're taking you're taking things away from me, thinking that you're solving the problem, and like I don't have time for your one million moms morality or, or that it's somehow disrespectful. Yeah. I mean, things are changing. Things are evolving. And I remember there was a shooting when American Horror Story Cult was airing. Mm -hmm. And that night there was a shooting in a a mass shooting in a crowd. Yeah. And what they did was they had deeply they they very quickly. I don't remember quite how they did it, but they very quickly edited the episode that Mm. aired. But then on demand and online, it was unedited. Interesting. Okay. 
And I preferred that because as as the audience member, I got to choose, you know, and right. And the other thing is, like, when they do this stuff, it, it puts an onus a lot of times on the art that the art doesn't deserve. Because oh, completely. Do you remember this, that stupid movie about South Korea or North Korea, rather? that The um, interview with Seth Rogen and James Franco? Yeah. Yeah. And it was like. North Korea, <laughs> by the way. I know. I, I, I corrected myself immediately. <laughs> OK. I, it's because I say South Korea more because. <laughs> That's the good part of Korea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost did a Margaret Cho bit, but I'm like, I'm already like <laughs> already <laughs> deep in this thing in a yeah. dodgy area. I don't want to add <laughs> impressions of another race. <laughs> yeah, just leave let's leave that for now. <laughs> I want to make it clear that like I understand like censoring art for yourself, like censoring what you expose yourself to. If you think this movie is gonna trigger you because you've been in an active shooter situation or Anything like that, or you know, you you're you don't like it because your kids have to do drills at school. I completely understand. I would I don't want to force people to see stuff, but I also I'm with you. I think the onus shouldn't be on the art. The onus should be on you, the viewer. And it's this weird sense of like moral. What I don't even know what to call it. Where like no, we're, it's it's because it, the the argument ends up weirdly being that. It's inappropriate that it's it, that it's right. disrespectful and inappropriate to the victims. And I'm like, and, so and my, my yeah. expression of ideas through the through a work of art is somehow inappropriate. But your bullshit legislation isn't a hundred percent. Yeah, I'm well, like, that's the thing. And and I do also want to say that this is the reason why Will, my husband, insisted we start a podcast is because Will and I just end up shouting agreements at each other, <laughs> which is I feel like where we're rapidly going to. But yeah, a hundred percent. I, I, it's like, I which is more gauche. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like a uh, thoughts and prayers tweet are going to see a, tra- a ta- trashy movie. Like yeah, completely. So that's where I'm at. Where I'm like, really? Because I'm offended by the performance you're putting on. But no, totally. You won't and that's the thing yourself. too. It's, yeah, it's all <laughs> hypocritical too. Is the is the biggest problem for me? Is it's like you don't even believe in what you're saying. <laughs> so like, why should I believe you? And why should I be punished? You know, for for your idiocy. And, and this that's, is a, that's this like is where a I get to privileged conversation because it's like we're arguing about, like I said, a trashy movie. Right. But it's like in times like this, sometimes you have to draw lines. And this is a line that I can very easily identify, you know? <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, it's like I don't think that my choice in entertainment should be beholden to anyone else's political views. And also there's a fine line between entertainment and education. Yeah. And also there's a fine line between like a docu-series and a satire and this is so clearly a satire that i can't even explain it well okay so on in that regard i was gonna say our little political rant is we, we need like a yeah. <laughs> like a news alert yeah. breaking uh, breaking news i can't say that's over but it, it probably just Kristen, just because it's over doesn't mean it's, I mean, really, it's really over, over. <laughs> and if you think it over maybe you'll be coming over. <laughs> okay episode was- break to play the entirety of never really over by katie perry that was deeply hilarious to Kristen and me only. <laughs> and, and Will, when he edits it later, he'll get a Extre- chuckle. Extremely topical, timely joke. <laughs> <laughs> Flop Katy Perry single from a year ago. <laughs> so anyways, we might talk politics again, but it th- this movie strangely is not about that. So it, it it's kind of like whatever. Yeah. So So moving on from that, the more I think about it, I really liked the movie. I enjoyed it. I had a good Did time. Did you? First of all, it's just a it's a good action film. It is a pretty good action film. That's a good that's a good like qualifier to put on it. <laughs> there were maybe two moments where I thought eh, that was sloppy where I could like see the the, the filmmaking mm. and the rest of it. I was like deeply in. And I do remember because I told you to remind me. Of yeah, something. something you've never seen in a movie before. Uh, I'm not saying that this has never been done in a movie before, but this is something that I've never actively noticed in a movie before. And it is that when, especially towards the end, (laughs) just full full spoilers right at the beginning, (laughs) full spoilers, full spoilers. I don't think it's going to be a shock to anybody that our hero is Betty Gilpin and that she is the final girl and that the villain is Hilary Swank, which Mm -hmm. I think that was meant to be a reveal. And boy, howdy, would I have preferred if it were? I would have really preferred it too, and I think you're right. But when they like revamped the marketing for the new release, it did it 
I, such a disfavor. They did such a terrible job and they did a real disservice because Hillary Swank in this movie would have been an excellent reveal. Uh-huh. Yeah. It, it really would have been. And I was actively trying to avoid the commercials because I was I could just tell. I was yeah. like I was like if they're trying to get us interested again, they're bringing out more footage. This yeah. is like mm-hmm. the end game's been in the theaters for 2 weeks, so we got to pull people. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and so there's a big fight between these two women and on more than one occasion, one of them gets the literal wind knocked out of them. Oh, yeah. I noticed that, too, because I was like, man, you hardly ever see that no, in, in like an action <laughs> fight. Like it, they're constantly John Wick is constantly getting kicked in the chest and he never has the wind knocked out of him. And it's like Betty Gilpin falls from like like a balcony kind of or like this, like the staircase, but it like. The middle over, part, it's called the, the landing. A landing, yeah, but yeah. it like overhangs like a like a double height ceiling, so she falls into the living room. And she falls on like a decorative table. Yeah. And when she kind of slowly rolls over, <laughs> she Yeah, and the- she's like wheezing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had the wind knocked out of you? Yeah, I've, I like fell off monkey bars. I've fallen off swings. Okay. Sometimes when you jump from the high diving board wrong. It's only ever happened to me once. And it was traumatizing. Yeah, it's awful. I, like, I, because I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what was happening to me. And I like went to jump onto the monkey bars, and my hand slipped, and I just mm-hmm. went right onto the back, onto my yeah. back. And I remember everybody rushing up and being like, "Are you okay?" And I didn't react. I, I kind of was kind of like nodding my head because I was awake, and yeah. they were all like, "Cool," and just walked away. <laughs> and meanwhile, I was sitting there like. Like, I couldn't yeah. talk. I couldn't. I didn't know what was happening to me. Because I feel like I did it, like, f- like climbing a tree one time, too. I've, like, I was kind of a tomboy when I was, like, a little girl. <laughs> you fell off your stilts? <laughs> I actually never fell off my stilts. I would have probably died if I fell off my stilts. They were six feet tall. If I had gone, if I'd keeled over off my stilts, I think I would have died. <laughs> but no, not my stilts. But I have had the wind knocked out of me a lot. And it, I think it really triggers that lizard brain part of you because your, your brain is like you can't breathe Mm -hmm. like something is the matter with you you can't breathe and so you your brain immediately goes into panic mode and you can't communicate like you can't talk talk because you can't you don't have any breath and it like happened that i remember twice in this fight and so i i found that very interesting and another thing that i found very interesting is again at least once if not maybe two or three more times they call a temporary truce for like 10 seconds oh my god yes hilarious (laughs) hilarious the the regrouping part was funny when they're both laying on the ground and betty gilpin is like just what like like 10 seconds and they're both like yeah 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 but my favorite one was Uh when they go outside and then they're coming back in the other kitchen door and betty gilpin is about to smash hillary swank through it but they've already been through like 12 plate glass windows and stuff (laughs) and hillary swank literally goes no more glass she just screams no more glass and betty gilpin nods like that's fair (laughs) yeah it's it's very funny i really i enjoyed it it felt very female and very realistic for a for female (laughs) fighters yeah and actually because that's another interesting thing is like betty gilpin gets her ass kicked a couple of times she does she really does it's good though in a way that is believable you know it's like i'm all here for like the the feminism and the girl powers and strong female characters and stuff but at a certain point you know you have to fight realistically yeah she is very like rambo for like most of the movie (laughs) to the point where i was like she has to have been in the military or something right Mm -hmm. and we do get that confirmation like pretty close to the end that she was in afghanistan and she was like in the shit essentially which i appreciated because i was like otherwise this is supremely unrealistic Mm -hmm. (laughs) from a woman that looks like betty gilpin well she's she's a good one she's got one of those faces that it's like you can dress her down real easy well that is accurate i was more just thinking about like a busty hippie blonde lady like i just was like that's something about this like like if we had just found out she was like a muay thai enthusiast or something mm-hmm. i would have called shenanigans but i would believe that this woman crystal from mississippi would have been in the military mm-hmm. betty's kind of talked about that where she was like i kind of get lumped into the pretty blonde category mm-hmm. but she was like i'm not quite and because well, i think the exact quote she said is she was like what roles are you going for when you look like britney spears's mean aunt sure <laughs> but i mean that is something said from uh a place of the privilege of still looking like Betty Gilpin. (laughs) That's a pretty good place to be. One of the things that actually delighted me a little bit about the movie is that there's more plot than I was anticipating. There definitely is. Yeah, I liked that too. It was such an interesting and not necessarily random, but 
there was there was a, a large amount of faces that I recognized. Mm-hmm. And part of me, even seeing the trailer the very first time, I thought, I don't want to see this. I want to be surprised by it. Sure. So I didn't watch a lot of the the marketing in general. Mm-hmm. And it like when watching the movie, I was like, man, so much of the marketing is just that first scene mm-hmm. of them like Hunger Games style in the clearing. I wrote down Hunger Games in my notes. Oh, it's very Hunger Games. Yeah, that, it's that very Hunger Games. <laughs> and they pull a real, it's it's tried and true. It's, a, it's an oldie but goodie. They pull a bait and switch with us uh, because they Drew Barrymore the fuck out of Emma Roberts. <laughs> they sure do. Like real hard. You are really positioned into thinking this is her movie in the beginning. Yeah, because, well, she's like pretty front and center in most of the most of the marketing in the first place. And then we wake up with her Mm -hmm. and we're like, oh, okay." And you sort of see Benny Gilpin. But even on the plane, like the the camera pans to her like asleep and stuff. And so it's like we see Betty, but she's aloof. Yeah, she's aloof and she like very smartly makes a compass with the like (laughs) pin from her name tag. She was like, I was like, what is she doing? And then she laid it on a leaf in the river. And I was like, oh, because it'll point north, correct? Yeah, I was like, that's some Girl Scout shit. And they have the gags and like in their mouth, which I don't know why. But for some reason, I mean, I understand the purpose of that, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's exposed. I was going to be like, I've only ever really thought about gags in a sexual way. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. I mean, so I, I agree with that. It seemed hellish in a way that I was like, this seems terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's not the way I want to use a gag at all. Yeah. Also, that was a very like industrial level gag. Even if I was <laughs> using a gag for sex, I don't think I want that one. Well, and so then we have the what's his name? Justin. Justin Hartley from This Is Us. Mm-hmm. Kevin from This Is Us. He seems like a perfectly nice gentleman. Uh, I like him. Really I really like don't him in- like him. <laughs> <laughs> Every seems- time he comes up, you're like, he seems so boring. He just is face blindness to me. It's I like, think he's very handsome. In the most generic, like, catalog way possible like i couldn't imagine a blander like well to which i've told you he actually does get some good stuff on this is us Mm -hmm. that i think shades his performances as an actor and gives more to his face i mean if if that thing is changing his eyebrows and nose then (laughs) Sure. I like him. I don't know what to say. I like him. Well, he was he was good. And, and they even have this like weird little meat cute. And it's like there is a part of me that wants to watch that movie. Yeah. Yeah. I feel very robbed of that movie uh, because they have like a box. I, that's actually the most scared I was in the entire movie was opening the box. Yeah. My mind was in like a saw place. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what's going to come out of the box? Like, I feel like a bomb is too easy. I But I was like very like I. I was very, like a very tiger. Brad Pitt, what's in the box? <laughs> so there, there's weapons in the box. They all arm themselves and immediately they're just, well, they're not really descended upon, but they start being shot. And yeah. like Emma's the first to go. It's a really good bit. It is pretty good. They really do start taking, ticking them off like one by one. Because mm-hmm. what happens to Justin? He gets exploded on the landmine. Because he, right. he he rescues the girl that the fell in the pit girl of the spikes. Pit. <laughs> and I was like, why are you pulling her yeah, abdomen you off even the bothering? pit of spikes? But, and then I was like, her one was through her leg. There's no way she's walking, but mm-hmm. whatever. And so they get like maybe 10 feet from the pit of spikes and he steps on a landmine and it blows them both up and it blows her in half back, back into, the, into pit. the pit of spikes. <laughs> and Ike Barinholtz tries to rescue her again. And I was like, bitch, there's half of her. <laughs> and she's like, please shoot me in the head. And he's like, no, I can't. And she calls him a snowflake and shoots herself in the head. <laughs> It's deeply hilarious. It was really funny. And we had a relatively full audience considering we we were in the small theater. Yeah. And the audience seemed to be enjoying it, too. There was a like a real significantly bummer part of the movie where one of the worst of the deplorables Mm -hmm. is not only from Florida, but from Orlando. And I was like, come on now. Like, he is from one of the coastlines. (laughs) Yeah, he's absolutely from like Daytona. Yeah, like like the or actually not the coastline. Like I mean, like the the panhandle or the middle. But he even had like the Florida tattoo, the terrible he, Florida tattoo. Yeah, like where a gang member might have a teardrop to like show that they have killed someone. He had just the state of Florida. In that regard, he could have been or like he could have been like from Paramore. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but it was just kind of they said it, and the whole theater was like, "Come on, man!" We literally all were like, <laughs> "Well, fuck." 
<laughs> Orlando's gay. Orlando. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was that was pretty funny. Ike Barinholtz is another one where it's like I've been a big fan of his back in the Mad TV days. And mm-hmm. he's also back to looking good again because he there was a while there was kind of like Ugh. when he was on the Mindy Project, I think it was on purpose. It was because his it was character a miscommunication was... between the two of them. <laughs> right. Right. Do you right, remember right. that? Yes, I do now. She was like attempting to reassure him in some way that like he didn't have to stay fit. And he misconstrued it as her being like, I want this character to be schlubby. Yeah. Like, I want you not to be fit. <laughs> and so it like went like two or three years. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. So the the basically, yes, the, the hunt pursues or, or ensues rather. And all of our like face characters essentially were gone in like the first 15 to 20 minutes mm-hmm. because Ike Barinholtz and two other people, the Florida guy and then um, another woman, they basically get to this gas station and you're like, well, this gas station is absolutely the gas station from the beginning of Cabin in the Woods. Mm-hmm. So I was I was like, nothing good is coming out of this gas station. But they go in there and they think they're going to like they're doing OK and they like use the phone to call the cops. And it's just absolutely Glenn Howerton on the other end of the phone. <laughs> and they end up getting killed by Amy Madigan and her husband. They were funny. They were very funny, but it was like Emma Roberts, Justin Hartley, and Ike Barinholtz are dead within 20 minutes. And you're like, I don't know anyone else except for Betty Gilpin, who has now been gone for 20 minutes. Well, and the average moviegoer will not know her. Exactly. So it was very, it was very weird. And I was like, this is going a direction I was not anticipating. Like, I didn't expect it to be so like the Hunger Games where like 50% of the people die right off the bat, Mm -hmm. you know? And so then basically... Amy Madigan and her husband are hilariously cleaning up this gas station and just like piling the bodies in the back, (laughs) in the back room. And then Betty Gilpin comes in and she realizes something's off like pretty much immediately. And from there, we like go with her. We get the the movie. Yeah. Yeah, Then we get the movie and uh, like a really funny, weird turn from Ethan Supley as like a really intense crisis actor truther i guess i don't really know what to call him okay betty gilpin was was fascinating and i the little bit that i looked the reviews all are like the movie's bad but she's great yeah she's amazing well they're saying it like it's a revelation and i'm i'm at that place where it's like on one hand i'm excited because my person that i champion is like getting Mm -hmm. what she's due but on the other hand i'm like where the fuck were you people four years ago and even then i'm not i mean she was on nurse jackie like yeah of course she's great. We've been new. Mm-hmm. Like, where where have you been about Betty Gilpin? Well, and you know what? Let me tell you, when you hire Betty Gilpin, you are getting choices. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. The amount, the, the caliber of decisions and the amount of choices that she made in this movie. Mm-hmm. I'm so curious what was on the page. I am very curious as well. And I'm very specifically, she kept doing this thing with her mouth. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what? What a thing to to do with your mouth. Like, what a character tick to, like, give this character. Well, it's like borderline Billy Bob Thornton in... Uh, Slick Sling Blade? <laughs> yeah, she's doing this, like, <laughs> Sling Blade thing for, like, 40% of the movie. It's and- very, it's very, very interesting. And that's the part, because it's like, I've never seen another Betty Gilpin character do that with her mouth. That specific, <laughs> she does a lot of mouth stuff because she, she really has does. a very expressive mouth. But I've never seen her do this with her mouth before. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's impressive. And it, it's so funny because actually I had just recently watched American God season one with our friend Anne. Oh, yeah. And we weren't even five minutes into her first scene. And Anne just goes, oh, this is why you like her. And yeah. I was like, what do you mean? And Anne was like, well, she's very good on glow. But she was like, the way you would talk about her, I was sort of like, I wonder what about her he connected with so much. Mm. And then Anne saw five minutes of her performance on American Gods. It was like, oh, this is this completely checks. Yeah, I mean, that that's definitely what put her on both our radars. Because that's the one where when she's like in the graveyard, pulling up her underwear, like yeah. walking over to Shadow. And I was like, I was like cackling. Who, who is that, this? <laughs> that's the one where Will was like, what is it with you and piece of work women? Like, he was like, seriously, what is it? And I mean, in fairness, she is the most wronged person in that scenario. <laughs> she's allowed to be vulgar, like she says. I, that has one of my favorite scenes in like film TV history. It's in the, the scene with her with and Laura, Laura Moon in the yeah. bathroom. And just the amount that both of them, but especially Betty, 
is able to convey like like the amount of things they are talking about in that mm-hmm. like short conversation because she goes to a self reflective place with this zombie friend of hers yeah <laughs> and it's just such a line where she was like I'm a vulgar woman and yeah. she's like grief and anger have made me vulgar it's awesome <laughs> she makes such a meal out of every specific word and thought it's really fascinating in a way that for a minute I was kind of nervous I was kind of like is this going to be too much because I think this movie walks a pretty tight tightrope between the absurdity and the groundedness of, mm-hmm. of it because it goes campier more than not. Yes, I agree with that. And I like that. But I, but it's like I, the, the hesitation you heard in my voice was, was about to say I wish it went campier more than it did. And I was eh. immediately second guessing that. Yeah, as I, was saying I, don't, it. I don't think I agree with that part of it. I think it's I think it's as campy as it needs to be, although. I do think had it gone campier, it might have gone over into that so bad it's good thing because with the amount of hype this movie got and the amount of conversation around it because of how it was delayed and everything and the and the politis, politicizing, I guess, of it, it's not as good as I wanted it to be. Like, it, it doesn't, for me, I don't think it has the rewatchability that if it were campier, it would have. I, I think it will. I wish it came out before Ready or Not. Mm, and it would have. No. Oh, was it going to still be after? That's Ready or Not's August. That's the one you're thinking. Okay. Ready or Not is better, but Ready or Not, Ready or Not is also more concise. It's talking broadly with with not a metaphor, but like this family represents a bigger thing. Yeah. Where this movie is like, here's this bigger thing, and let's try and distill it. And it's not very distillable because, and this is the part where we might go a little bit political again. It's like, Speaking broadly about my political opinions, I'm 34. I didn't live through Vietnam. I didn't live through World War II. I didn't live through, you know, all of this stuff. So I don't really know what it was like in a place to compare times of turmoil. Okay, But in this time, I feel like we are in a place where we do have to draw lines. We kind of have to say this is right and this is wrong and it's not open to interpretation. Sure. And I didn't feel that way, you know, however many years ago I was like, it it felt a bit more like, well, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't. I didn't feel the way I feel now five years ago. Mm-hmm. Like, like that, that recent. It's something that Aisha Tyler said that uh, she's one of my favorites. And when she was on the talk, I watched it like every day and I thought it was very wise and it really resonated with me. But they were talking about the 2016 election and they were talking about the discussion of like the fallout and what it means and all that. And like they were like, you know, is it worth losing friends or losing relationships over politics? And Aisha Tyler was like, well, what do you mean by that? And she literally said, racism, sexism, homophobia, ETC, those are valid reasons to terminate a relationship. A hundred percent. And that's not making you partisan. You are allowed to be like, I think that you are this and I cannot condone that by being friends with you. Yeah, a hundred percent. I feel like those are proper consequences like i refuse to be friends with someone who is like actively racist homophobic sexist xenophobic anything i'm not going to i'm not going to engage with you because it's not debatable is what it, we're yeah, saying it's not debatable and in, in for me that's like mm-hmm. the of all these people having rights that's not debatable for me now having said that that doesn't mean that i don't think that they're are or aren't things worthy of commenting on or even lampooning and stuff. Cause it's like, as you know, I, I think I'm fairly good at laughing at quote unquote myself, like, like, mm-hmm. like laughing at things that are true. It's like, mm-hmm. if you were to make a joke and be like, Oh really? Will? when's the last time you X, Y, or Z, I'm very much like, ah, you got me there. That's true. Ha ha ha. Right. Right. What was it recently that we were watching where they, they made a jab at liberals and I actually thought it was funny. I thought it was a good jab. Oh they were God. Like, I don't know. I mean, this movie made a handful. Well, well, and a couple of them. Yeah, like it was something recently where they were like, you're so good at demanding. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, all, shit. all you want to do is demand a better world, but you don't know how. Or, you don't want to do the work. Yeah, to actually do it. You're too lazy it. to do the work to actually do it. I don't remember what it was, but I remember that. And I was kind of like, okay, that's fair. You got me there. Like that's a, <laughs> that's a good take. I, yeah. You know, and and it's not even saying I agree with it, but I'm like, that's a valid, you know, or even just as millennials, it's like I've talked to several of my friends about like the the bad things about millennials, and I'm like, I'm actually pretty positive on millennials. I mean, an example is that. Um, yeah, I mean, we are millennials. No, I know, but it's like the things that. In, in a lot of ways, the things that make us awful are also the things that make us awesome because that, oh, sure. the trailer for um, shit with um, Issa Rae and Kumail Nanjiani. Lovebirds. Lovebirds, where they're running away and the millennial girl's like on her phone. She's like, they're getting away right now, but she's slower because she's wearing shoes that she can run in that are actually super cute. And it's yes, like She actually looks amazing. That like supportive thing. It's like that's yeah. a very millennial. Like, sure, sure. So I guess to get back into the hunt, it's like I'm totally open to making cases about, quote unquote, both sides. However, right. there was a both sides feeling to this movie that it's just mm -hmm. we're in a place where that's a trigger word where it doesn't mm -hmm. mean what it means. You know yeah, what I mean? Bo both both sides now is like a dog whistle Uh huh. where it's like because it was used in a discussion of Nazis literal nazis <laughs> it can't be used in a real way for debate anymore uh-huh and i think that's how we've gotten to the place where we are socially and politically mm -hmm. is that words don't mean what they mean anymore yeah. we're all having to talk in code and it makes debate especially hard because when you go back with a transcript it's like yes but what they meant by that you know right right it's like when a mafia mob has been like have a good day it's like that's a threat you know what i mean like yeah i mean they're like there's um <laughs> to reference a movie i didn't care for from last year there is a, a point a couple of points in um the irishman and apparently there was a code for like are you a hitman and the question was like do you paint houses? Mm -hmm. That was like the code. Like I mm -hmm. heard you paint houses. That's the kind of place that we're in right now where it's like, I have to be asking you in such a veiled way that almost I don't know what I'm asking you. Mm -hmm. And again, going political, keeping it broad. I'm not a fan of Trump and he has <laughs> a reputation for not making any sense. Yeah. And the thing is more often than not, I actually know exactly what he's talking about. Because my roots are in the conservative mm. talking points. When I was growing up, my family was way more conservative than we are now, like yep. all around. And so when he's talking about flushing the toilet 15 times, I know what that means. What does it mean? Oh, uh, they think they <laughs> think that the means. that the Democrats like overregulate environmental stuff. And so they like reduced the the water flow or they, they put like regulations on certain on like why electricity, like light bulbs and stuff yeah. to make things more environmental. And so he's basically saying, so now I have to flush the toilet 15 times where I used to be able to flush it once when we had our good, strong, powerful Republican water. I that's mean, what that's, that means. That's telling on himself more than anyone. <laughs> but my point <laughs> is that it's like I actually more often than not, I because <laughs> it was my first language, I can sure. read between the lines. OK, and that's what he's doing so frequently is he's Ugh. putting out the words and and his people can connect the dots like they they know what he's really saying. And it's just interesting. It's very hard to fight from a logistical place. Right. Yeah. No, because everything out of his mouth is a dog whistle. And it's it, it, it is so funny because it's all emotion based in yeah. a way that like in a general sense, Republican, the conservative way of thinking claims that the liberal way of thinking is too emotional. Mm hmm. <laughs> it's just because I don't I, I because, OK, to bring this back to the current issue, which is the coronavirus, I am concerned for children who can't go to school because they won't eat. They mm -hmm. won't have food at home. If that makes me too emotion based, then fine. But I don't believe that the United States should have starving children mm -hmm. in the year 2020. Fine. And then call me emotional. I don't really know what to tell you. Mm hmm. Yeah. So anyways, the times that the movie would go into that, I feel like it really undercuts itself because I think that the action is good. The performances are good. The comedy, especially the physical comedy is good. Mm -hmm. And the quote unquote social satire, like when they're speaking it in dialogues mm -hmm. or in dialogue, it's very basic in a way that like I mentioned to Will when you were in the bathroom, I was like, if I was 21, I would have thought that it was revolutionary. Yes. I would have been like, man, they're really saying that, you know, like, 
A hundred percent. And that I think goes back to the whole both sides thing, because it's like the movie is trying to skewer both sides and in trying to do so, it skewers neither Mm -hmm. the way that it wants to. And that was kind of frustrating to me where it was like these specific liberal elites in this movie are awful. Mm -hmm. They're terrible. They're performing their wokeness and then they're doing all of this stuff as like revenge on, you know, redneck hicks. Some of the redneck hicks are like not great, but they're mostly just like people living their lives. Mm-hmm. And these liberal elites have been have like taken some of their shit out of context and inflated it in such a way that they're justifying their actions. And so it's like it it's not doing a service or a disservice to either side in the way that the movie thinks it is. Mm-hmm. Which is where I bring up Knives Out again, because if you're a regular listener and made it this far into this episode, it's a topic I bring up a lot. But one of my favorite lessons in storytelling that I've learned by doing this podcast is that some of the best work you can do as an artist is by asking good questions mm-hmm. versus telling good answers. Mm-hmm. And the Knives Out That was just a conversation sort of laid out in front of us. And it's sort of up to us to decide how we feel about it. And it's relatively apparent how the movie feels about the conversation. I mean, obviously, these are Hollywood people. Liberal elites. (laughs) Of course, 100 percent. But it also but having said that, you know, yeah, there's like there's also kind of an issue where that we don't get resolved until more than halfway through the movie, which is. All of the people who die at the beginning, we don't know their sin. Mm -hmm. And even still, we never find out Emma Roberts' sin, except for that she's photographed with, like, some kind of politician. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I it was too fast for me to see what it was, but, like, the only one that was, like, I think worth the punishment was Justin Hartley. <laughs> I knew that's what you were going to yeah, say. Big game Shane or whatever, because he was killing a rhino. He had a, they had a photo where he killed a rhinoceros. I'm They're not endangered. Okay, That's is, the worst thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I am not pro big game hunting, uh, but I do have to say that I am aware that there is actually frequently more to the conversation than that. Mm. A lot of times with the big game hunting, it's sanctioned by the government and they have paid an exorbitant amount of money for the privilege of doing that that will be used in the infrastructure and to further the rights. And a lot of times it's stuff like the rhinoceros was already extinct anyways, like nothing was going to come of it. And again, I'm not for it. I'm just saying that no, I do know. I don't, that, I don't I'm like that it. attitude. <laughs> I'm not for it, but I'm just saying no, I, know no, I know that you're there's not frequently more to it than is represented in the media. I mean, maybe, but yeah, I'm, I'm just stating that I am aware. I don't want to be one of these like <laughs> liberal cucks that doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I'm aware that the, that there is usually more to most conversations than what fits in a tweet. I but. will allow that. <laughs> but still. Because I also, I mean, I'm with you, especially re-starving children, where I'm like, you know, we're at a place globally where it's like we should revamp the system. And it's like we have the abilities to do certain things now. Should we at the very least discuss whether or not we <laughs> we right. want to to do it you know what i mean like that's where i'm like let's just let's have a conversation you know yeah, what let's i mean just like talk about it <laughs> maybe what if you know what, what would that look like and the old guard is like no i say to that <laughs> yeah they're like talking about it as an admission of failure and it's uh, yeah. like i mean <laughs> Regardless, yes, I I think this movie is at its worst when it's scratching that itch. I think it's lowering itself to that point because because also they do a thing. I like the movie. I like how it ends. I like what they end up doing, but they do sort of take the coward's way out Mm -hmm. by making our hero ambiguous. Yeah, we don't ever get confirmation on who Betty Gilpin is. So is she the right crystal or not? Because she makes a point of like, there's another crystal in my town and that's the one you wanted. And she. She either is telling the truth or she lies until Hillary Swank is dead. I believe her because I don't think the person that we watched for that whole movie is capable of that kind of uh, subterfuge. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) she was very matter of fact. Yeah. And my other biggest thing, and we've covered it a little bit, but I, I sort of have a fundamental issue with this conceit in general, because I don't think that an average person is as inclined to snap and like i believe an average person can kill i believe more people can kill another person than we think yeah but i think usually that's that has to be in self-defense i don't think or in the in passion it's like i don't believe that the methodical nature of 
Right. Like, I think in the moment I would, I would, I could be like, yeah, I want to fucking kill these people. But I think in, if I were in a year long execution of this plan, (laughs) I would have started to have second thoughts. And so that, that I kind of, I have to just turn my brain off there. And another thing that I actually did like that the movie did once I turned my brain off was I like the notion that like you can breed some of these things into existence. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because I think that's how we've gotten some of the places that we are. Well, to bring it back around to the shootings and stuff, it's like, I I think we're manifesting them in a a way, you know, Mm -hmm. like, and so that I thought was a really interesting commentary. And I do like that they made fun of the gate because I actually despise that. Yeah, because the... (laughs) Watergate. The, the was scandal a, is called Watergate because the hotel is called Watergate. The scandal the gate yeah. part doesn't have anything to do with it. And so now we have like nipple gate and pizza gate and yeah. all this stuff. And because uh, I think I said once before, I was like, I want something else to happen at the Watergate so that we have to say Watergate gate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it I don't know. Drives- my dad and his girlfriend go to the Watergate whiskey bar all the time. <laughs> Maybe drives- I could get him to shake something up. <laughs> kind of drives me nuts, but <laughs> but yeah, I I actually really thoroughly enjoyed this movie, and I think it does have a rewatchability. I'll I'll have to see. I'll I'll I'm open to it, but I just I didn't. I think it just doesn't have the watch rewatchability that I hoped it would. Mm, okay. And so I think I will probably end up rewatching it because it was very funny. I laughed a lot, but it was it's just like not a hundred percent what I was hoping it was going to be. Mm-hmm. And they oh. killed the piggy. So they did. They shot the piggy. It was, it was rude. Such a cute little piglet. It was really rude. Yeah. So, but the spoiler. dog lived. It's quick. You know, the dog did. She took the dog. Uh, yeah. It's quick. I mean, they just shoot the pig. <laughs> still. But. He was, it, yeah, it was very rude, and I think it didn't need to happen. Oh, there I, also, I didn't, I don't want to keep going super long, but a, uh, there were at several points, there was like a huge, what, what I wonder if it was bigger in like a previous edit, but there was like an overarching, like not comparisons, not the right word, but like with George Orwell's Animal Farm. Mm-hmm. And I, in a way that I was like, huh, I was like so weird. And so there were a couple points like that where like, Fucking Hillary Swank at the end, she's like, you know, trying to do that whole like I'm a I'm an even keeled villain speech situation. <laughs> and she was like, no one ever knows, but the best way to cut a tomato is with a bread knife. And I was like, everybody knows that. Well, everybody does not know that, but everybody should know that. And yeah. then she she said something. What was the other thing that she said? Oh, well, it was at the end, and she was like, Betty Gilpin was like, why did you call me Snowball? And she was like, it's from it's a reference to George Orwell's Animal Farm. And Betty Gilpin is like, yeah, no, I know. But like, why am I Snowball? Snowball's an idealist, blah, blah, blah. And Hilary Swank is like, you read Animal Farm? And I was like, everybody read Animal Farm. Well, again, that's like many a, people have read Animal it, Farm. That's like a that's like <laughs> Not, an English class yeah. thing. And I mean, I, just, I technically read it. I don't know. I don't remember anything. I can't tell you what Snowball is. <laughs> well, it's a she's a pig. It's a pig. OK, he's a pig. But I just that's the thing where it's like lots of people experience the same thing. Like everybody (laughs) goes to high school. Like I don't really I don't know, whatever. But those were my couple of gripes where I was like, Hillary Swank, you are not like a like above that many, like as many people as you think you are. Also, Mm -hmm. Animal Farm is like 60 pages long. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's a hard read. I feel like how mad she got at that like meeting where they were firing her. (laughs) Yes, yeah. But I I really like the performances. And the thing is, I mean, this is probably just like a media movie for me, but I I feel like I need to defend it because of all of the controversy around it. So it's like I'm going a little harder in favor of it than I think I would have if it were just a movie. This movie deserved to come out when it was supposed to come out. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I I can't decide if it is going to do better now or if it would have done better then, but it didn't deserve to get shuffled. Like it did, I think. I think it was not related enough to the, you know, tragic shootings that happened when they did to have been pushed like that. So. Mm -hmm. So. okay, well, I'm good. Believe it or not, I actually probably is a lot more I could have said. No, I mean, I could probably keep talking about this movie for another hour, but (laughs) we've gone on. Yeah, we've gone on for a minute. So. All right. Well, um, if you want to let us know your thoughts about The Hunt, since it's the only movie that came out this weekend, (laughs) 
Uh, you can talk to us on Twitter, at So I'm Watching, Instagram, at So I'm Watching This Show. You can also follow along on our website, So I'm Watching.com, which links out to everything, including our Patreon, where we are still covering Riverdale, though they're on hiatus right now, and 911 is coming back on uh, this Monday, the 16th of March. So we will be covering that as well and potentially some new stuff in the future. And then other than that, you can rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen. And that's it for us. Bye. Bye.